right, so where I want to start today, we're, we're talking about conforming or not conforming and, and doing so through the lens of you are a natural scientist. So a, a physicist, a geologist, chemist, biologist, right? but your experience isn't really as, as that kind of professional. You, you've experienced science through the lens of, of a student. So what I want to take time just to kind of reset. Science is more than just the biology class you sat in. It's more than just learning about the periodic table. I want you to take, take 20 seconds, turn to your neighbor. What is science? What's the goal of a scientist? What are they trying to do in this world? Talk to your neighbor. <laughs> Understand the natural world. Okay. How do they do that? What so? I'm sorry. Backtrack. So, what kinds of questions would a scientist be interested in, in asking? How do diseases spread? How can I make this material stronger? How can I make it lighter? Which wing shapes give me a better lift on an airplane? Can I predict when the next major storm is going to hit? These are questions that we can try to try to investigate, try to ask, and try to come up with, with answers to. How does the scientist do that? What kinds of questions do they ask? They need to be able to make observations and predictions from the natural world. They need data and results that are testable, measurable, and reproducible. If they can't do that, then they can't form answers to these questions. At, at their core, scientists are constantly striving to develop new explanations that explain the natural world. Okay. In this regard, it, it, I guess the summary of my talk is going to be scientists by their very nature are nonconformists. They're constantly rewriting, looking at what is accepted, finding new ways to explain it, finding out what the flaws are in our current understanding. And, and rewriting things, finding new models that explain what we're observing and what we're seeing. So th their job is to challenge what's out there, to, to see what's accepted, and if they can find new ways of explaining it, they do so. And if they can't, then, then well, they can. So by their very nature, scientists are not conformists. So I thought I would give you some historical, uh, historical references. Uh, but but before we get there, so how do we develop a new scientific theory? So uh, what is kind of the timeline? How do, how do ideas change and evolve through, through the lens of science? New scientific theories are often uh, refining or, or replacing already accepted ideas that we have about the world. I'll, I'll give you some examples in, in a slide or two. But we're, we're usually refining something that's already accepted because maybe technology has changed. We can look at the world in a new way. New evidence comes to light, and our old way of understanding the world it just doesn't fit anymore. We need a new explanation that fits new information that we've collected. So we're often challenging what is accepted, what is understood to be true. New ideas are, like I said, they're going to challenge older ideas. It's not enough to challenge an accepted idea. You need evidence to back up your new hypothesis, your new conclusion. The scientific field is only going to accept new ideas 
if, like I had in that slide before, if the results are verifiable, reproducible, measurable. So there's a lot of scrutiny that goes on in the field of natural sciences. And evidence is only going to be accepted once, once research is deemed valid. And validity is decided on the quality of the scientific evidence. And so uh, evidence needs to be published in journals, it needs to go through peer review, it needs to be reproducible by other, other scientists, it needs to be verified as, as being true before it's going to be accepted. And, and we'll show some examples of that too later. Alright, so historical examples. Science has been going on around for since the dawn of time. Humans are, by their very nature, interested in, in explaining their world. Right, so here's a classic example of nonconformity in science is challenging what is accepted to be true, developing new explanations when new evidence comes to light. And a, and a great example of that is the geocentric model of our solar system. And maybe you know what that is. So the idea that the Earth is the center of our universe, that the sun, the planets, all the stars, they rotate around the Earth. This was, this was the accepted model for how our solar system and universe were put together for thousands of years. And it makes sense. As, as a human standing on the earth, the earth does not seem to be moving through the heavens. The sun rises each day and sets each day. It seems to be revolving around the earth. There's seasonal movement of the constellations. If you look at the constellations, they change throughout the year. They, they too, rotate in the night sky. So from year to year, you'll see different constellations at different times of the year. It seems as though everything revolves around us. And Humans also tend to think everything revolves around them. So it makes sense. And teenagers. Yes. Right? Yes, in particular. It makes sense that the Earth would be the center of the universe. All right? OK, now, this starts to break down in the 16th century. All right? Astronomers like Galileo, Kepler, they want to understand how do these planets, how do celestial bodies move in the night sky? How, how do they move through the sky? Telescopes are invented, right? We don't no longer need to be able to visually see something with our eyes. We can, we can observe moons orbiting around Jupiter. That blows people away. How can moons be orbiting around not the Earth? If moons are orbiting around Jupiter, maybe, maybe Jupiter, you know, maybe that, that blows up this whole idea, this, uh, this accepted model that the Earth is the center of everything, all right? And and, and then this retrograde motion of Mars is a big trouble. So charting the pathway of Mars does some really interesting things. I'll show you that right now. Okay. So this is a short little video. So Mars and Earth, uh, this shows our accepted model today. They, they both orbit the sun. Right. Earth has a, a shorter pathway to take. Right. And, and as Earth moves, and Mars moves around the night sky, some interesting things happen. So there's no audio to this. It's just some slides, but uh, let's see. I'll pause occasionally. Yeah. Okay, so most of the time, planets move gradually through the stars from east, west to east, like the sun and the moon. Uh, so if you watch them in the night sky, over the time of the year, they move from the west to the east through the night sky. All right. All right. Okay, however, Galileo noticed something interesting. Mars, occasionally, about every two years, will be traveling through the night sky, stop, go backwards, and then continue on its pathway. It makes no sense through the lens of physics. We call this motion retrograde motion. We're going to see how it happens. Okay. So about every two years, watch the pathway. Let me get rid of this ad. One Mars year takes about two Earth years. So it takes, takes Mars about two, takes about twice as long for it to travel around the sun as the Earth. Uh, the Earth is this little blue circle, Mars the red circle, the sun is in the center. Okay, so just showing Earth moves a lot faster through its orbit than, than Mars. All right. So at this time, uh, we're, it's going to slow down and then sync up. And you need to put yourself kind of in the in the presence of being on Earth. What would it look like?
right. So imagine you're standing on Earth and you're seeing Mars in the night sky. These stars on the left represent all the constellations that are millions of light years away. So they don't really move all that fast. Mars moves in our field of vision much faster than, than the rest of the, of the night sky. And you can chart the planets move across the night sky when the constellations are standing still. So if, if you were on the Earth and you looked up at Mars, the frame of reference would put Mars, if, if, if we say the top of the night sky would be, uh, would be the east and the bottom of the west, Mars would be in the east. As our orbits continue, Mars is moving from east to west in the night sky. And that's, that's what it normally does. So this isn't worrisome. However, it's still moving from east to west. However, as Earth starts to pass Mars, look what starts to happen. Mars, Mars starts to reverse itself. And so for a while it's going from east to west, but then it starts to back up. And then it starts to go again. And what it looks like in the next sky will be, will be on this next slide. But this is called retrograde motion. And it, it wasn't really noticed for, for a long time until about the 16th century. Uh, so in, if you were to look up in the night sky in 2009 to 2011, this is Mars going across the night sky over, over a couple months. And again, the constellations don't really move. They, they don't move except seasonally. So Mars takes this pathway through the night sky. This blows up the idea that Mars could be orbiting the Earth. An astronomer, a physicist named Kepler is describing how planets orbit other stars. And it's deemed that, that it has to be being done in ellipses. So they travel in an, kind of an oval around around another celestial body. This retrograde motion oops. if retrograde motion were to happen, our original geocentric model would say Mars is traveling in this kind of pattern, where it all of a sudden is doing this little loop-de-loo in the middle of its orbit. And that just isn't explained by, by planetary physics. An object that's traveling around another body is not going to just stop do a loop and then continue on its path. So it blows up the idea that the Earth is in the center of the universe. We need another model to explain Mars's orbit. And the only thing that makes sense is that Earth isn't at the center of the universe, or at the center of our solar system anyway, and perhaps we are traveling around the sun and the other planets are as well. And if we're moving faster than Mars, then it would appear that Mars would be moving backwards in the night sky, even though it's continuing on its orbit. It's just slower. And this new model fits the data that's observed. And it's eventually accepted, and that's what you guys accept today, hopefully. Though some, some people still deny it, that, that this is the true model. But they do so not through the lens of science. They do it through, through other lenses, which we can talk about. Um, all right, so nonconformity in science. Blowing up old models that don't make sense anymore. The new when new evidence comes to light. So that's what science does. All right? Scientific views, they change over time, especially when we introduce new technology. When we can look deeper into nature, when we can take more than just, uh, you know, when we get new tools that help us delve deeper, our old ways of understanding that they don't work anymore. Okay? The idea of, of the atom is a good example of that. There's more models of the atom that have been developed in the past 300 years than, than fingers on your hand. All right? Uh, that's not a good analogy, but that's okay. Don't, don't ad lib things when you're, when you're giving a presentation. All right? So the idea that the original atoms were just considered to be little spheres, little, little hard BBs, eight balls, if you will. Right? When, when, when the charges are discovered, we, we come up with this idea that, oh, the atom isn't just one solid object. Maybe it's made up of negative charges. They're sitting in the atom somehow. The nucleus is discovered. 
Well, now we have a new way of, of, of looking at it. And now we need to know how are the electrons flowing around this atom. Quantum physics starts to become involved. And, and now we, the atoms aren't even on orbits like planets. They're just in random spots. And they can be in two places at once. And they just appear. And they, we don't know where they are. String theory is an idea of, of how to represent atoms. And that might not even have an atom. And we don't really know. All right, so your kids in seven years might have a completely different idea of what an atom is to what you guys understand. Just because we, we tend to, we get new information, it doesn't fit, things get revamped. All right, nonconformity in science. All right, how often, when given new information, so, so what's the process of conforming? How, how does something become accepted? Is it always accepted? The answer is no. There's, there's lots. For, for a theory to be accepted, uh, that there's a lot that has to go into it. Catch up. Okay. Okay. You're a scientist. You think you've discovered something great. Okay, you're going to publish your results. Uh, that's, that's how you get your information out there. So scientific journals are published every month, every year. However, in order for your ideas to be taken seriously, you need to publish in a peer-reviewed journal. Your evidence gets looked at, you know, since we're non-conformists and we're breaking down previously held ideas, probably if I come out with a new theory, I'm going to have to be trashing someone else's understanding of the world. So if I come out and I say, scientist X is wrong about, about their understanding. Here's new evidence. This is the way we should look at it. Scientist X is going to try to verify that, that my ideas hold water. And if they don't, then, then my theory is not going to be accepted. All right? This is a great example. All right. 1998, Dr. Andrew Wakefield publishes an article in The Lancet, which is a, a big time journal in the UK. He establishes a link between autism and the administration of vaccines around the age of two. There's thymosol in these vaccines, which is a mer contains mercury. And he contends that these, these vaccines that are given in, in big clumps around the ages of, of two are causing this huge uptick in autism. And this is published. Uh, it's, for, for 10 years, this, this idea is, is accepted. There's just one problem. No one else can produce his results. There, there's countries that keep really great medical records that when they crunch the numbers, there are no links between autism and, and the administration of vaccines. Other scientists are skeptical. They can't produce his research. In 2010, it's proven that he falsified his data records. He came to false conclusions. He has to retract his paper, which is a huge deal. If your paper's retracted, it pretty much means that you were lying, and, and it's wiped off the record. It's a, it's a big deal. They take away your scientist card. Yeah, you can't go to the scientist club anymore. It's really bad. <laughs> But retractions never happen. They're very rare. I mean, sometimes you come to wrong conclusions, but if, but if you're found falsifying it, it's really bad. The problem. Oh. Oh. There's still this idea, though, right? So this is 10 years of bad science being out there. And people like Jenny McCarthy get up and, oh my gosh, Vaccines cause autism, and, and it's still an idea that even though it's not accepted in the scientific community, it's, it's still being held in, in popular culture. It's still like a, a skeptical thing because autism tends to show itself around the age of two. So, so they're seeing, you know, and that's when you get a lot of your, a lot, I'm not, maybe not two, maybe I'm one and a half or, or one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, just like to make a connection to conformity versus nonconformity in your science and verify conclusions that the results went well beyond like, him being falsified, right? Like literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of parents did not get vaccines for their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Huge which all caused happened. giant outbreaks of right. things that we thought we got rid of. So kids were getting measles and bumps that they hadn't seen in years and, and so on and so forth. But people got on the bandwagon right, of vaccines caused this which could have caused conformity causing you know, catastrophic events. Right, right. exactly. And you have, you have smallpox that's showing itself in, in this country that was eradicated, but thought gone. You have mumps and measles outbreaks at Disneyland a couple years ago. 
and, and it, it takes a lot to undo this kind of thing. But, but again, ultimately, uh, again, over a period, you know, in the, in the long run, things are going to hold water or they're not, if, if the evidence is there to back it up. All right. Another example, local example, Flint water crisis. This has been in the news, right? So, uh, spring 2014, high lead levels found in Michigan drinking, or Flint, Michigan drinking water, right? They switched their, their water source from the Flint River, or from, from Detroit water source to the Flint River. High lead levels found in Flint. All right, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality samples the water, say everything's fine. Don't worry about it. It's just a, a couple, a couple old service lines. Nothing is wrong. Don't look over here. Okay, but the community says otherwise. Right, and they reach out to a Virginia Tech professor, Mark Edwards, who comes in and does independent tests, does the correct test. The Department of Environmental Quality did very flawed testing. Uh, they tested new. They they didn't test with the appropriate procedures, they didn't test enough houses. Uh, but they bring in they bring in this professor from Virginia Tech and, and he independently tests the water, disputes the results of the study. The state of Michigan still says nothing's wrong. Uh, meanwhile, pediatrician uh, Mona Hanna Atisha, who is a, a pediatrician seeing kids in Flint, notices elevated blood levels in the in blood tests that are coming back. She starts sounding bells. Enough evidence piles up that eventually the state can't deny it anymore. They have to issue a public health emergency. They admit high lead levels, and, and now there's this big fallout. But, but again, this is an example of scientists not accepting what's being told to them. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Evidence suggests otherwise. And if evidence suggests otherwise, you've got to keep digging. You have, you have to go and find out what the truth is. So more, more non-conforming. All right, so, so when do scientists have to conform? Do they have limits? What can science explain and what doesn't it explain? Right, so there's limits to what science can do. And that's important. Because sometimes, sometimes even scientists lose sight of this. It's a, it's a big deal. Science cannot make moral judgments. What does that mean? A scientist can help describe how the world is. They should not be making judgments about whether the state of affairs are right, wrong, good, or bad. And it's not really their job. So that's, that's the job for others to do. Science can't make aesthetic judgments. What does that mean? It means science can't tell me whether Beethoven music is beautiful, a ballet performance is great or boring, or a Van Gogh painting is ugly or gorgeous. Right? It, it can't make those distinctions. Maybe, maybe a psychologist could do that, or, or maybe an English teacher could do that. But, but science can't do that. That is, that is a, that, that's a deeply held belief. That's a personal opinion. Science doesn't really deal with opinions too much. Science doesn't tell you how to use scientific knowledge. For almost any important scientific advance, you could imagine positive and negative ways that that, that knowledge could be used. An atomic bomb, atomic you know, nuclear chemistry could be used to, to make a power plant, could be used to destroy millions of people. Right? Again, it helps us describe how the world is. It's up to policymakers, it's up to ethicists to describe to decide how to use what, what's discovered. Or how to use the knowledge that, that we gain. And then lastly, science does not draw conclusions about supernatural explanations. It can't describe your faith. It can't measure, uh, you know. So th there's this, there's a big, sometimes it pops up, uh, this, this, this idea that science and religion butt heads. And it's really not the case because it's not science's place to butt heads with religion. Science deals with things that are measurable, that are verifiable, that, that, that you can see and measure and, and prove right or wrong. And, and, and the presence, just by its very definition of a supernatural being, is by, by its definition not measurable. You can't measure someone's faith, what they believe, what they know to be true. All right, so these are just separate realms of nature, it's separate ways of understanding our world. And a lot of times they, they coexist, and, and they're not 
really at odds with each other. And, and, and sometimes, and this is kind of one area where, where maybe some scientists kind of overstep their bounds a little bit, is you, you shouldn't be, it's outside of the realm of science to, to dispute or to draw conclusions on, on supernatural things. Uh, it's just a different lens at which you can look at, at the world. It's, it's either, either right or wrong, That's what I have. Take 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Talk to your neighbor. See if you have any questions that you would like to ask. seriously for for ideas to take hold and, and to be deemed important and reliable you, you do need supporting evidence uh, so uh, so yeah there, there are levels of, of conformity for sure um, but 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 always I think there's there's a skeptical eye to, to is this is this good or, or does it hold water to, to what we know about? so you're talking about just science that builds on other science versus disproving yeah, like how uh, I'll completely agree with you, like the geocentric or the heliocentric model yeah. that was blowing out of the water. But then even with the heliocentric model, you had people building upon each other and say, oh, if it's heliocentric, then that explains this, and mm -hmm. this and this, and you can build it up. I, I, I think, one, we got to make sure that we, and this was talked about this morning, kind of like the philosophy of language and like how we see conformity versus not conformity. You know, someone who sees that as a limit, right? If we discover heliocentric and that's it, you know, someone might see that as like conformist versus the non-conformist is like, that's not it, there's more to it. So yes, I'm gonna take what you've discovered, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it beyond, take it beyond what is just accepted as that's it or that's true. How can I add to the truth? How can I change people's perception of the truth? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, 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 and in one way, that needs to happen. Because if my model can't explain other things that are observed, then my model is no longer good. It's no longer valid. So, so maybe you know, in my chemistry class, it's great we can think of atoms as BBs if, if what we're talking about are phase changes. But when we start thinking about uh, ionization and, and charges being thrown around, now now my model is no longer good. So maybe one model is okay in this instance, and, and so we need to know what the limits are for. For hypotheses and yeah, you can't talk about quarks and so Right, right, right. Yeah. 
Okay. Did anybody see the new TED Talk that came out of Vancouver in February about um, the Kepler project and a phenomenon that they can't explain? Did you see that? Yeah. So like there's, in the Kepler project, they had a, a basically, in short, a telescope that observed a particular field of vision in the universe and observed the light coming from stars. And every time that light dimmed, even by a fraction of a percent, they knew that a body had passed in front of that star, so they were looking for planets. They had a computer analyzing this data, and they felt it was inadequate. The computer wasn't giving them everything they needed, so they called on the population of, of at-home scientists to also view the data. And so at-home scientists were finding planets that the computer wasn't finding, but they also found a phenomenon that they cannot explain. Our, all our astrophysicists, all the at-home scientists, that typically when a planet will pass in front of a star, even a giant one like Jupiter, there's maybe a 1% dip in the amount of light that escapes from the star. Something passed in front of it, there's a little bit of a shadow. What they started noticing in very irregular patterns is not just a quick dip, indicate a planet passed in front of a star, but this sort of uh, uh, arching, very large dip, up to like 10% missing light and coming back up. They have nothing that they can think of, even in theory, that can reproduce the amount of light that's blocked out, so the size of this object, but also its shape. That a quick dip shows a circular object, the arching dip on their graphs show something very irregular that's not shaped like a planet. And essentially, a lot of wild theories are out there on, on what it is as far as uh, the existence of you know, what we would call extraterrestrials. Um, and, and, and what they're seeing is evidence of something that exists in the universe that they can't explain or physics exactly. Yeah. So that goes, I, I think, along the same line. We look at the universe, we're just thinking like the universe is full of just these stars and these planets, right? And then we get this new evidence to build on top of that of the, of the you know, light being obscured from the stars. And now all of a sudden the data is highly irregular. How do you explain that? Uh, go ahead. And it, it, you know, science will, it will never be done. There's no end to, to what we understand. <coughs> Okay, now I know everything. We're good. We can, we can stop exploring. And, and sometimes we hold on to old models that might not be accurate just because they are useful. So even if string theory is really great, if, if it is so theoretical and, and crazy complicated that, that I don't need it, and I can use my older models that aren't necessarily right, but they get the job done, then, then sometimes those hold, even though they're... So that might be conformity viewed as, even if we're using things that we know aren't aren't 100% accurate because the utility of them is, is good. And even string theory itself was born from people kind of being locked in a box of thinking that they had this old one model that worked for them mathematically and some other people had a different <coughs> model that worked for them mathematically, but it didn't answer their questions and until they combined those two mathematical models and stopped looking at the knowledge as separate. It's where they kind of just go, wow, mathematically together they actually work and explain some things that we could really explain. Mr. Warren. Speaking of non-performing, I appreciate that scientists know their role and they should make moral judgments. They should, uh, your last slide interested me. <coughs> Isn't it, wouldn't it be hard when you make a discovery that you know is going to be, could be used for the, for the betterment of mankind or isn't it, isn't it a moral duty when you are an expert in some area to, to share with people the possibilities of the moral implications? Um, I would think that would be nonconformity, not following the guidelines, the limits, but also beneficial. I, I would agree with you, but I think when you start doing that, you're leaving the realm of science, <laughs> and you are becoming the... You're, you're kind of coupling your scientific knowledge with the knowledge of ethics or a knowledge of social science. And so you're, you're, you're kind of combining fields. You're becoming kind of multidimensional at that point. And, and the reason I bring it up yeah. is, and I agree with what you're saying, is when you guys think about the value of nonconformity, there's another limit, possibly. When, when does it have its limits? Um, I think I've, I'm not very knowledgeable on this, but Einstein knew that when he 
he was putting the out of water. They, they had a really hard time doing that. And the moral, the moral on the Right, and I think the only thing that kept driving them was the idea that the Nazis were going to get there first. You know, and, uh, truly. And, and they knew the moral implications of what they were doing. But, uh, but, it, but, but th I think that takes it out of the realm of, of the sciences and it takes it to another place. Yeah. Maybe that's a scapegoat so that people can do immoral things and not feel bad about it. But, yeah. But I just have a more question of um, ethics is uh, slowing the progress of science. Ethics slowing the progress of science? Um, perhaps. Well, I, the connection, I mean, obviously we can make for those who have advanced ELA is break the world. You know, it's very clear that we have a capability to create a, sci a, a, a society like that through our, our knowledge and ability to manipulate the human genome. But there's a lot of ethics out there, people who at least have enough power for now to be able to say we should there that. There should be ethicists. There should, right. you know, in, in some instances, the, that's why we have ethicists and people that think about, that's why we have legislators that think about this kind of thing because it's necessary. <laughs> of science and the act of science is the non-conformist part? Or do you think it's like more of what the people themselves are doing that leads them to non-conformist ideas? Sort of separating science. So you scientists. think like you would only become a scientist if you're a non-conformist? That or you think they're in it for the non-conformity or for the I didn't I don't know if I'm taking your question somewhere you didn't want it to be. I would say, in, by their nature, scientists are very curious. And, and if you're curious, you're looking for anomalies, you're looking for things that don't fit, and then you're trying to explain explain those anomalies. So you think that non-conformists are drawn to the, or like the subject of science? It's like a generalization. I don't know. Um, Possibly. Yes, yeah, I think and curiosity is, plays into that more than I think non conformity. And this is where I was talking about earlier yeah. about answering these questions from perspectives, right? Yeah. And different viewpoints. You know, if you approach this question very cut and dry with the definition of conformity or non conformity that's limited, um, you know, yes, you could probably come up with a definitive answer. But when you look like look at a question like yours, is an element of non-conformity curiosity. Where does curiosity play into the spectrum of conformity versus non-conformity? I'm someone who doesn't accept answers as the truth and knowledge as something that exists, and I'm constantly searching for more. Does that make me a non-conformist? Am I a conformist if I just accept answers and I move forward? And is there a benefit to being one or the other? So that's a twist to the question that you can approach your video from, or you can ask that same question about conformity and nonconformity in math or the arts, right? Yeah. Um, going along with what you were saying about nonconformity, I was also going to ask what do you think about um, it's kind of borderline on nonconformity, but a, a person's general ability to disregard what other people think as being a characteristic of a scientist. Well, like, give an example of this. One of the most famous scientists are, you, you know, a few of them, Albert Einstein, Richard Feynman, uh, Nikola Tesla. All of them had a really blatant disregard of what other people thought of them. And a lot of them, a lot of them didn't really think about themselves like very few highs. Like, so Einstein, if he was going to be like questioned about like some amazing theory that he had, yeah. would tell reporters like, Oh, you must have confused me with Einstein. We get we get confused about that a lot. I mean, eccentric people tend to not care what others think. I mean, th those are I don't know. I, I don't know if it causes you to be a scientist. You know, I I don't know. Well, what what I was basically saying is like these are the people who like seek to get like rewarded and, and like for instance, um, like they, uh, 
is the time it refused to sell well products. And that, uh, and for instance, the, the, uh, one of the latest people who uh, won the Nobel Prize in math refused that as well. Uh, it, it, I think that's, that kind of speaks volumes about, like, do you care that much about honors as, as a scientist, as a nonconformist that you do compared to the actual, like, just the experience of finding something new out in the world? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that you could paint a broad brush across okay. all. All professionals, though. I mean, yeah, I, and and I, I wouldn't say all scientists are not. If you're a, a cancer researcher, you might. That's an unknown question. You're not really challenging a worldview right now. Like, oh, this is this is how we cure cancer. You know, that's just a big unknown. You might just be a curious person who has a personal tie to it and are incredibly curious about it, and that might not fit so well into a bubble of conformity or not conformity. Or, you know, but but there definitely is a strong history of non big scientific, especially scientific discoveries that kind of frame shift how we view ourselves in the world and how, how everything's put together. I love the conversation of separating scientists from science, yeah. but I also love the conversation of misconceptions of conformity and non-conformity as they fit in science. Like, I know typically kids who are considered very like A-type personalities, like organized, in-the-box thinkers, like they do things very structurally, not so creative. They're always labeled like math and science kids, which is kind of the opposite of what Mr. Clay was suggesting, that like, you know, uh, someone who thinks outside the box who never is satisfied with this, like particularly people are like looking for the answers or have to get creative to discover new math or discover new science. Um, so there's misconceptions, I think, even about the idea of science and the personality that would fit. And, you know, Einstein is not your perfect Right. <laughs> Anything else? Questions in general about the project, the video, what it should look like, other curriculums? Group back here said, um, I'm going to use you as an example. All right, I'm going to throw you under the bus just a little bit. She was like, said something along the lines of, why are we having to talk about it through science when I want to talk about it through arts? Remember, there's four curriculums. You have to do arts and history, but arts can be anything. It can be language arts, the books we're covering in language arts. It could be actual art, um, or, or, whatever, or dance, or, or film, or whatever the case may be. Fashion, somebody brought up earlier. Fashion, dance, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's history, which also is a broad, broad idea. There's plenty of history to cover. Um, but then you're picking two other <coughs> curriculums. TOK isn't really one of those curriculums, TOK was a way for you to think, to bring it all together, to help you question. Um, but anything that falls under the natural sciences, many of the sciences that Mr. Clay represented, um, falls under the, the natural sciences, there's human sciences, there's ethics, there's religion. Um, there's a number of those areas of knowledge that we presented to you uh, in the TOK lecture. Um, and remember, you're picking four. Two, you have to do the other two are choice. Um, so find the strengths in your group. Find the things that you guys can agree on and exploring, maybe through different perspectives. Um, so make sure the work is equitable and reasonable. Anything else? All right, please thank Mr. Clayton. Yeah, and that's because the stability in the end.